All right, so welcome. Um, tonight is March 1st, and we're looking at the dharmas and the perfection of wisdom. And I'm hoping that this is a topic that's going to be interesting to everybody. Um, it's going to be presented in two parts. Uh, the problem is it doesn't really fit well in one presentation, and it also doesn't really fit well in two presentations, so I added some stuff for you instead of just following the original article that I was using. Next slide, please. <coughs> So, to start off with, um, the Prashaparamita texts are particularly relevant to us because of their influence in Japan and Tibet, but also by extension, um, through Japan, they've had a major influence on Buddhism in the United States and Europe. And for us in particular, as people who recite the Heart Sutra as part of our daily service, uh, it's extremely relevant to us. Uh, in texts like the Heart Sutra, we often encounter statements that we can grasp intuitively, maybe sometimes, after recitation over a long period of time, combined with contemplative practice. In general, the Prajnaparamita texts are very difficult to understand, though, and they make huge leaps in how we're to understand our experience of the world, and they also don't give much justification for why we should be thinking that way. For example, we get phrases like, from the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, but no one's explaining in the text how we're supposed to understand what this means. Other examples are, for instance, the Diamond Sutra, which is a very famous short Prajnaparamita Sutra, and then also the numerous sutras that are just called the Prajnaparamita Sutra and often broken up by the number of lines that are in the text. So the Prajnaparamita Sutra in 8,000 lines, 500 lines, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> a major source for this discussion is an article called The Ontology of the Prajnaparamita, which was written by Edward Kanzi in the mid-50s. And the reason that I'm using it is it's actually a sh surprisingly good article about general trends in the Prajnaparamita texts. Um, what he tried to do was basically, in a 14-page article, get the major trends about how people think about dharmas and also the extension of the theory of emptiness that occurred in the Prajnaparamita text and then was elaborated by the Madhyamaka school later. Um, the first thing, though, that he uh, well, let's back up for a second. So, so his aim was to try and tease out what he saw as the philosophical claims that the Prajnaparamita texts were making. And something that's important to note about that is that most of the philosophical arguments occur in Shastra, not in the Sutra themselves. So in other words, the Sutras were in circulation for a long time, and there were reasons that the things that are in them are in them. But really, the explanation and justification of the claims that are made in those sutras are not in the sutra themselves. Um, therefore, one of the things that Kanzi himself cautions us about is that when we look at Prajnaparamita sutras, we shouldn't look at them as philosophical texts in the way that we look at like an academic text. They're not trying to make a rigorous argument that we should be able to follow and have some sort of debate about the, the premises of. They're basically just giving you conclusions <laughs> and you're supposed to accept them and continue on with the text, right? Um, honestly, this shouldn't be too surprising an approach to see in Buddhist Sutra, considering that Buddhism largely relies on mind-to-mind -mind transition, transmission, meaning that a student can learn the text, but the correct interpretation comes from practicing Buddhism with a teacher and with a community. So it's assumed that most of the knowledge you need to decipher a lot of these texts will come from outside them. The many statements that seem confusing and overly paradoxical in Prajnaparamita texts actually make more sense when they're contextualized with these philosophical arguments that were happening around the time of their composition. So the overall goal of this discussion and its second part is to follow the taxonomy that Kanzi provides to understand the issue at the core of the Prajnaparamita texts, which is the development of the already existing doctrine of shunyata or emptiness. So before the Prajnaparamita text, shunyata was understood to refer to the emptiness of the five aggregates, or skandhas. So in other words, uh, we could analyze a person in terms of these five component pieces, and if we look at each of the five pieces, we can't find the presence of a self in any of them. And this was sort of the extent of the idea of shunyata as it had been presented originally. The Manyamakas later uh, extended this theory and developed rigorous logical arguments defending its application to not only the five aggregates, but all of the dharmas in Buddhism. And this is sort of the kind of discussion that we see in the Prajnaparamita text. 
This development itself is a watershed in Buddhist thought which changed the goals and possibilities of Buddhist practice itself. So considering that the title of the article that I was using for this is Ontology of the Prajnaparamita Sutras, uh, it might be useful to talk for just a second about what ontology is for those who don't know. Yeah, we'll talk more about them later. So it's, yeah. <clears throat> don't worry. Um, so Kanzi says in his article that if ontology in the usual sense is interpreted to mean any attempt to contact the true nature of reality, the Prajnaparamita sutras are replete with it. And that's the definition that he gives us. Um, if you look in Merriam-Webster, for instance, you'll get a couple of definitions. One of them is a branch of metaphysics concerned with the nature and relations of being. And the second definition is a particular theory about the nature of being or the kinds of things that have existence. And this is, these are sort of both the senses that we're going to be looking at Darvis in over the two-part discussion. So uh, I guess the question on everybody's mind is who cares about this? And I just made the assumption that hopefully we do <laughs> as Buddhist <laughs> practitioners who presumably believe that Buddhism has something to say about the notion of absolute truth or some form of reality beyond our conventional experience. Also, uh, we will be talking about psychological attitudes and not just ontology, but that's going to be relegated more to the second part of this discussion when we look at what the Prajnaparamita texts have to say about dharmas. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Enjoy. <laughs> so, <laughs> to understand the development of thought around Shunyata, we need to understand how dharmas were used pre-Prajnaparamita texts. And pre-Prajnaparamita deserves some qualification. So, Kanzi estimated in his article, um, as somebody who spent his life studying the Prajnaparamita texts, um, that most of them were composed between the year 100 BCE and 1100 CE. And you'll see some debate about that, some people saying that um, most of them were composed by 600 CE, but we can just take his thousand year time period and say that they were being composed during that time. And what that means is that they aren't strictly composed after the text that, that comprised the Pali Canon. So in this discussion, we're using pre Prajnaparamita to denote viewpoints that don't conform to the expansion of emptiness that characterizes the central quality of those Prajnaparamita texts. So these are really two trends that were happening at the same time. One started earlier than the other, and so saying pre and post Prajnaparamita is really just a matter of convenience for us. <clears throat> so, examining the assumptions of the pre Prajnaparamita sutras, first, there's the assumption that dharmas are a result um, or sorry, the use of dharmas are a result of the assumption that the ultimate facts of the world are not what is directly available to our senses. The implication is that we need some method or strategy to access those facts to understand the real truth. This is even codified in the teaching of right view in the Eightfold Noble Path, which states directly that one must develop a new way of thinking about the world. Uh, quoting from the Maha Chattarisaka Sutta, uh, also known as the Great Forty, and what is the right view that is noble, without affluence, transcendent, a factor of the path? The discernment, the faculty of discernment, the strength of discernment, analysis of qualities as a factor for awakening, which will be important to us. The path factor of right view in one developing the noble path whose mind is noble, whose mind is without effluence, who is fully possessed of the noble path. This is the right view that is noble, without effluence, transcendent, a factor of the path. And it's interesting to see that analysis is part of the first step on the Eightfold Noble Path, right view. We can also compare this assumption to the methods and conclusions that come from the contemporary sciences, which refer to entities such as atoms, molecules, electromagnetic fields, uh, ideas like quantum teleportation, etc., which we have no way of deducing from our sensory experience without developing tools and techniques that allow us to understand them abstractly. The Buddhist analog to this view is that the world is composed of a constant flow of momentary dharmas, or phenomena. We should not confuse the term dharmas as being the same as things. The distinctions between things and dharmas are implicit, but we are to understand, based on discussions of dharmas, that there are something more like uh, discrete phenomenal units. While things could refer to a chair, a television, etc., dharmas are much more constrained, with examples being things like contact, acquisition, faith, 
uh, direction, time, space. So the dharmas are mentioned in early sutras, but never really formalized into a complete system in those sutras. We could see them as a technical language, maybe, that the Buddha uses to present his teachings, a view which is much more in line with commentators from the Madhyamaka tradition, as we'll see in part two. Several schools tried to create comprehensive lists of dharmas to collect them into a complete system for study. Within these lists, the dharmas were divided into taxonomies, starting with the two major categories of conditioned and unconditioned dharmas. So for instance, unconditioned dharmas would sometimes be, nirvana is pretty universally agreed on, it has to be unconditioned by definition, but also sometimes things like space or uh, products of the practice of cessation and meditation. <clears throat> conditioned dharmas are most of the dharmas, and these include things like the five skandhas, the 12 sense fields, the 18 elements, the 12 links of dependent origination, etc., etc. So, eventually, these lists, as people went through early sutra and tried to gather as many dharmas as they could, started to get larger. The Theravadins had a list with 174 dharmas. The Sarvastavadins came up with 79, including to Kanzi, um, according to Kanzi. Uh, Mizuno says that they had 75, so there's already some disagreement on that. The list that I'm going to show you has 75. Um, the Yogacharans had 100, and I think more people agree on that. Um, so next slide, please. And this is something that I made a while back. You do not need to read this entire chart, <laughs> please. It's there for an example of the sort of projects <laughs> that people were working on. So you can see that the two major categories are unconditioned dharmas and conditioned dharmas. And then within the conditioned dharmas, we have the major categories of form, mind, associated mental functions, and then functions that are dissociated from the mind. And within these, they basically try to create a complete list of dharmas that are mentioned in sutra. The idea being that if you could, <laughs> if you could create a classification system like this and you had them all in one place, you could learn all of these dharmas because that's an important component of right view and also your advancement on the path. <clears throat> so, to understand why some sort of project like this would be happening, it might be interesting to look at a couple of examples from the Pali Canon of the sort of instruction that's given in Sutra. So we could take uh, the Satipatthana Sutra as an example, which is a favorite of ours here, because it's the sutra that teaches the four foundations of mindfulness. The sutra is of particular interest because not only does it present a complete practice system, um, but according to the sutra, if you follow the practice system in the Satipatthana Sutra, you could be awakened in as few as seven days. Come on. <laughs> yeah, People tonight. all of a sudden woke up. They're like, seven days? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, now you're written. Now, right? Unfortunately, yeah. they said it at the end, it's, it's an oral tradition. You know, they probably missed everything that was said, and then they were like, wait, what did I just <laughs> miss? <laughs> And they, so and they had to make a list of video playback. <laughs> yeah. And a brief side note here is that actually, talking about this text in particular, um, Bhante Sujato, um, a Theravadan scholar, actually uh, believes that the version of the Satipatthana Sutra that we have today was actually composed in the year 20 BC, which means the Prajnaparamita texts were being written for roughly 80 years before that sutra was compiled. But these things are sort of ambiguous because. Um, it's also believed that it came from earlier source material, and it's just the version that we have is from yeah. that time period. Um, next slide, please. I didn't want you to have to look at that really confusing diagram for a long time. I thought there was going to be a quiz at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually made that diagram, so that was me. The, <laughs> the Satipatthana Sutra presents a meditation program in which the meditator contemplates the body, sensations, mind or consciousness, and dharmas. Each section presents the object of contemplation analyzed in terms of dharmas. So first, the body is contemplated in terms of its postures, the presence of the natural elements, earth, water, fire, and air in the body, following the breath, and even contemplating the body's eventual stages of decomposition. From contemplating the body, we move on to the contemplation of the sensations, which we contemplate as arising from the body, and they're categorized in terms of feelings of pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neutrality with respect to the practitioner. 
Um, from there, we move to mind or consciousness, which is arising from the sensations that arose from the body. <clears throat> and these are contemplated in terms of the three poisons and the dhyana factors, which we don't necessarily need to enumerate, but these are stages of meditative concentration, which would affect one state of consciousness. And then finally, the meditator contemplates the dharmas arising from the consciousness that has arisen from the sensations that have arisen from the body. These are divided into the five hindrances, the five skandhas, the six sense bases, and the seven factors of awakening, one of which, not surprisingly, is dharma vichaya, which is the discrimination of dharmas. And uh, for anybody who's interested, the complete seven factors of enlightenment are sati, or mindfulness, um, dharma pravichaya, which is the investigation of dharmas, virya, or energy or diligence, uh, priti, which is sort of a meditative state of bliss, um, prashrabdi, which is tranquility, samadhi, concentration, and upeksha, which is equanimity. But again, of interest in these, we have the analysis of things in terms of dharmas being a central component to awakening. It seems natural that being presented with teachings in this style, creating a large list of dharmas and learning them would actually be of the utmost importance to advancing Buddhist practice, since all of the teachings that you're getting are conveyed in terms of this vocabulary. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. And for another example, we could look at the Sala Sutta. I just liked this clip art, and it's actually um, came from a yoga studio in Manchester, but it conveys the message of the sutra quite well. Um, we have a person on the left getting hit with one arrow, and he has big eyes. And the person on the right is getting hit with two arrows, and saying, arrows are the worst, I get hit with more arrows than other people? There must be something wrong with me. What if there's another arrow? I can't handle another arrow. I'm going to fall apart if there's another arrow. I will disappoint everyone. But, uh, if we want to actually look at what the sutra itself says, um... That's not what the sutra says? <laughs> it's, this is the, this is... Maybe a translation. <laughs> um, so the sutra uses the famous image of the second arrow to explain dukkha. Um, this sutra actually comes from earlier, possibly, than at least the, the Satipatthana Sutra that we have now. It comes from an earlier period than that, but the source materials of Satipatthana might go even earlier. So again, time period is a little ambiguous, but this is representative of the same style of teaching. So, in this text, the Buddha says, and this is a quote from the text, when an unlearned, ordinary person experiences painful physical feelings, they sorrow and wail and lament, beating their breasts and falling into confusion. They experience two feelings, physical and mental. It's like a person who is struck with an arrow, only to be struck with a second arrow. That person experiences the feeling of two arrows. In the same way, when an unlearned, ordinary person experiences painful physical feelings, they sorrow and wail and lament, beating their breasts and falling into confusion. <laughs> they experience two feelings. Sorry, the repetition made me think I had uh, accidentally copied something twice. It's supposed to be this way. They experience two feelings, physical and mental. When they're touched by painful feeling, they resist it. The underlying tendency for repulsion towards painful feelings underlies that. And to stop quoting from the sutra, the sutra goes on to explain that ordinarily we think the antidote to unpleasant feelings is pleasant feelings. This is because we don't understand the origin, ending, gratification, drawback, and escape associated with feelings as a general category. We are attached to pleasant feelings and then we try to preserve them, and attached to unpleasant feelings and then we try to avoid them. By extension, we are attached to birth, old age, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness, and distress, or in a word, dukkha. But this isn't the same for the Aryas, or the Noble Ones, who follow the Buddha's teachings. A disciple of the Buddha does not resist painful feelings. They understand that pleasure is not an antidote to pain, and thus don't crave pleasure either. The Sutra says, and I quote, If they feel a pleasant feeling, they feel it detached. If they feel a painful feeling, they feel it detached. If they feel a neutral feeling, they feel it detached. End quote. So by extension, they are detached from the above categories of birth, old age, illness, death, etc., leading up to dukkha as a general category. For an Arya, unpleasant feelings only consist of one arrow, the physical experience of unpleasantness. 
But the Arya does not suffer the strike of the second arrow, which is the Dukkha arising from trying to deny or modify essentially what are the laws of the universe. Thus, we see another example in which analysis in terms of dharmas is used to understand, uh, or is used in practice to reveal a side, a side of our experience that we believed we understood, and in doing so, reveals a different way of looking at how we respond to and integrate to our experiences. Next slide, please. So Kantian's article clarifies quite well, I think, the process of developing wisdom with respect to dharmas as being a three-step process. First, there is an act of differentiation, which is the breaking up of the seemingly unified personality and its experiences. Uh, persons and things are understood as mere conglomerations or heaps, uh, which <laughs> means skanda, of dharmic events. The second is an act of depersonalization, the elimination of all references to I, me, or mine, which is carried out in when we break up these experiences, we look at all of the dharmas and can't find a trace of our unique sort of selfness within any of those any of those dharmas. And third, there is an act of evaluation. One must feel that description in terms of dharmas is somehow superior to description in ordinary terms. So we could summarize this process by saying that someone hears Buddhist teachings, learns how to see their experience in terms of dharmas through instruction and contemplative practice, which results in understanding the emptiness of the self. In other words, that no I or me is present in any of those skandhas, and through this experience, they come to value dharmas as a way of understanding the world that is closer to absolute truth than worldly wisdom. But another way, using dharmas to understand the world reveals something that we didn't notice about it before. So we see some sort of usefulness in it, and thus we want to go farther. <clears throat> so this process leads the practitioner to see what can be translated as the own being of dharmas, which is svabhava in Sanskrit. And this notion of own being is critical to the difference between the pre and post Prajnaparamita way of understanding not only what dharmas are, but also the goals of Buddhist practice. So, the term own being or svabhava is unfortunately not very clear in the text. But luckily, Chandrakirti of the Madhyamaka school, who lived from roughly 600 to 650 CE, gives us an account of the ways that Svabhava had been understood in his Prasanapada, which translates to clear words, it's a commentary. He claims that the term was used in three ways. To mean the essence or special property of a thing, the essential feature of a dharma, and the third way is as the opposite of other being. So first, the essence or special property of a thing. We could take the example of fire, which is a thing. Its own being, in this case, is heat. This kind of own being is defined as, um, that this is a quote from Kanzi, that attribute which always accompanies the object because it is not tied to anything else. So in other words, we should expect that whenever we make a fire, it's going to be hot. And so heat is the own being of the fire in this case. <clears throat> The second category is that we can um, see svabhava as being the essential feature of a dharma, and this is a much more constrained definition. So in this sense, own being is that which carries its own mark. Um, put more simply, a dharma's own being is that which makes it what it is, what distinguishes it from everything else, or what makes it unique. In the Prajnaparamita text, this method of analysis actually continued. For instance, in a passage of the Shatta Sahasrika, 30 types of own marks are enumerated based on the functions or effects of the entities being discussed. So, for example, the mark of feeling, which is a dharma, is experiencing. The mark of perception is taking up. The mark of impulses or sort of mental constituents is uh, is together making, like bringing them together as a synthesis. And the marks of consciousness is being aware. The skandhas uh, have the mark of suffering or dukkha. The natural elements have the mark of venomous snakes, which I particularly enjoy. Mm -hmm. And the sense fields have the mark of being the doors to misfortune. 
And these are actually kind of fun because the uh, doors to misfortune I also particularly like because the term for the sense fields is the ayatanas, which can be interpreted two ways. It either means an entrance or something that goes into an entrance. And so it's generally used to refer to not only the sense organs in the body, but also the things that are perceived by those sense organs. So it's the things that go into the sense entrances of the body, but it's also the sense entrances in the body. So calling them the doors to misfortune is actually some clever wordplay. Um, another one that I find interesting about this is the idea of the natural elements having the mark of venom snakes. And we can actually find a little interesting section in the Dajita Loon, which is a commentary on one of the Prajnaparamita Sutras, which is sort of an encyclopedia of East Asian Buddhism. And um, <laughs> in that particular text, there's some commentary asking why in Sutra people always come up to the Buddha and ask him how he's feeling, if people in the Saha world are really difficult to teach, etc., etc. And they say, well, the Buddha's perfectly awakened, and like he's extinguished all these karmic outflows, why are you always asking him if he's feeling okay? And the explanation is that, well, the body is composed of the elements, right? And the elements, we know from this dharmic analysis, are like venomous snakes. And as long as somebody has a body, there are four poses they can be in. They can be sitting, they can be standing, they can be walking, they can be lying down. And in all of those, it's like the snakes, right, are all fighting for balance in the body. And so if one stays in any of these postures for too long, it's like you start to feel pain. And that's one of the reasons that, you know, the Buddha has a physical body made of the elements that people are always coming up to him and asking him how he's feeling today, which I found very interesting but strange uh, caveat. But it ties right back to the venomous snakes being what the body's composed of. Um, anyway, so the third sense is the opposite of other being. And in this sense, own being or svabhava may be understood to mean the absolute, that which is not dependent on anything. And it makes sense that the absolute truth must be unconditioned, or it's characterized by impermanence and non-self, and presumably isn't absolutely true, and that it could be false under some circumstances because it can be causally affected. Compared to the absolute, all of the other sort of separate dharmas must be, instead of uh, having svabhava, they must be parabhava, which means that they are sort of relatively defined. <clears throat> this is a distinction between what we here at TBI often refer to as either the relative and the absolute, or sometimes the provisional con or conventional reality and an ultimate reality. So that's the distinction we're talking about in own being and other being in this case. Own being absolute, other being being sort of the conventional experience. And there's probably a reason this is the most familiar way of, uh, of understanding this notion to us, even if we hadn't been using this terminology before, which is that the, the Mahayana actually rejects the first two as being merely provisional constructions, and only accepts the third as having any sort of ultimate or absolute truth. Next slide, please. So, the sort of path that we've taken so far brings us to the beginning of the Prajnaparamita text. And based on the understanding of own being as being the opposite of other being, the Prajnaparamita texts see own being itself as empty, which is what this compound at the top is, svabhava shunya. Right? We see shunya, which we recognize from shunyata, the term that we translate as emptiness often, and svabhava being own being. And so in this case, own being itself is empty. <clears throat> this can be contrasted from the pre prajnaparamita uh, idea that self cannot be found in any of the dharmas. In the Prajnaparamita text, even the dharmas cannot be ultimate facts. They're merely imagined to be ultimate facts, but are really constructed from other things and or dharmas. And this is necessary if the dharmas are to be subject to dependent origination, which is central to Buddhism, meaning that they have causes, conditions, effects, and leave karmic traces, an idea which also seems to be very consonant with our experience of the world, that things are causally acted upon with very little effort. <clears throat> so returning to the earlier example that we had of a fire, right, and heat was its own being. We said that fire is a thing and heat is its own being in the sense that um, 
in this in the sense of being fire's distinguishing characteristic, but heat is dependent on other things in the case of fire. For example, the <laughs> this is Kanzi's example. For example, the coming together of a lens, the sun, some sort of fuel, oxygen, and many other factors uh, are where the heat is actually coming from. And this is only one possible scenario. We can imagine many different ways of starting a fire. <clears throat> but heat cannot be found in any of those things on their own, which presents a problem. It seems to arise when they're brought together in a particular way, and then ceases when fuel runs out, water is thrown on the fire, etc. And this means that heat has to be empty of own being. An alternate interpretation that's provided by Kanzi is that dharmas, when viewed with perfected gnosis, which is the term he uses, reveal an own being which is identical with emptiness. In other words, in their own being, they are empty. And I find the use of the term gnosis interesting, uh, implying that the Prajnaparamita, or perfect wisdom, the perfection of wisdom, is a mystical wisdom that must be directly experienced to become comprehensible. This certainly makes the Prajnaparamita view consonant with a text like the Satipatthana Sutra, for instance, which invites the practitioner to develop insight through contemplative experiences, which will eventually lead to awakening to the absolute, even though they're going about their subject from a slightly different direction. <clears throat> Wisdom is perfected when we see that there is no trace of heat found in the things that make fire and then extend this intuition to the entire field of experience. And this intuition is not developed intellectually, but developed through contemplative practice, which means that in a sense, one must feel the emptiness of dharmas, as opposed to looking at it from a solely analytical perspective. Hmm. And next slide, please. So, where are we going? <clears throat> next time, we're going to be looking at the Prajnaparamita texts on their own, right? Um, we'll have multiple perspectives on what the nature of dharmas are, if they are now empty of any form of own being, what it means for them to, I guess, be provisional constructions, but then also in some way be conveying an ultimate truth, and understand the ways that various commentators, in particular Chandra Kirti, um, try to look at all of the different ways that people were understanding what it meant for dharmas to be empty. This will also lead us to looking at the psychological attitudes that should result from dharmas now being considered empty. So this should change the way that we think about our experience of things in the world and also how we think about Buddhist teachings when we're getting all of these teachings in the form of dharmas, right? And then we'll also be looking at the logical structure of statements made about dharmas, which I'm sure everyone's going to love because that's the part <laughs> where we get into non-duality, which is everybody's favorite. And then of course, lastly, um, as Kanzi says in his own article, we would be remiss if we didn't look at the religious motivation for these texts, <laughs> considering that primarily they are soteriological texts, meaning that the purpose of them is to be used in a way that brings about some sort of religious goal, right? In our case, we're looking at liberation, the ability to practice the bodhisattva path, etc. So that's my... That's my tentative plan for where we're going next week. We should have uh, a little bit of time for questions, not too bad on the timing. Um, next slide, please. This is how we're all feeling now. <laughs> it's better than being a venomous snake. <laughs> True. The fact that was a very disturbing image. I've got it. It actually is disturbing. Now I think about that a lot. <laughs> That's why you don't read Nagarjuna. Okay. Um, is Ishishima Sensei? I didn't see him. I don't see no. Sensei. There he is. Oh, there you are. Oh. Good morning, Ishishima Sensei. Ah, good morning. Ohayou gozaimasu. Ohayou gozaimasu. Do you have anything you. you would like to, uh, like to comment on? Well, uh, I think uh, Prajna Paramita is a quite uh, important uh, sutra that we uh, should reject our attachment so we have so many attachment anyway so how to uh, take off such attachment that is a practicing kind of emptiness this is uh, i think uh, <clears throat> uh, derived from the uh, madhya maka shastras by uh, nagarjuna he says all things 
that arise through causes and conditions, I explain as emptiness. Again, this is conventional designation. Again, this is a meaning of middle way. So uh, uh, everything arises uh, from the causes and the condition. But the, that's why uh, svabha, nothing, no svabhavas. Then we uh, attain to a kind of emptiness state. Then when we attain to the ultimate state of emptiness, then uh, we uh, have compassion towards saving people. That is a process from sunyata to uh, form, uh, rupa. So uh, rupa to uh, sunyata process, this is seeking dharma. And when one reaches to the top of emptiness, then we are coming down to uh, think of sentient beings, how to save them. Uh, so this is a very interesting uh, process of uh, sunyata understanding, I think. And that is my uh, thinking. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Ichijima. And uh, Sensei, did you have anything that you wanted to comment on? Or? No, just that the venomous snakes as the body are disturbing imagery. That's all. <laughs> so fair enough. Um, so I guess uh, let's stop the recording. Oh, yes, thank you. And then if anybody has any questions or comments.